Hello and welcome to this lecture. In lecture one, I addressed the broad implications of a socio-historical context when studying the Quran. I stated that the values inherent in the Quranic vision for humanity sought to counter a worldview dominated by an implacable environment and the harsh social realities that went with it. In this lecture, we consider the socio-historical context. This means examining the social context of the Quranic revelation as addressed by the Quran. We will look at six areas very briefly. Life in Mecca and Medina at the time of the Prophet, Bedouin influences and their cultural implications, the issue of Arabic language, religious values in Mecca and Medina at the time of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad as leader and reformer and his migration to Medina, and finally the impact of the Quran and we will look at two cases very briefly. Let's begin with the concept of the socio-historical context. What does this concept imply? Put simply, it means that the text, which is the Quran, and its immediate environment, that is, context, are connected. This is always the case in the realm of religion, any religion. For example, cultural references provide context as does the language used. Those of you who have studied linguistics, or better still speak a second language, will know that all languages draw on familiar images, metaphors, norms and values. These images and values anchor the text in reality for the reader. That is, in the reader's reality at the time of the production of the text or later. By contrast, our 21st century values could never have reflected the 7th century Arabia. Today's values would be incomprehensible, even bizarre to the early readers and listeners of the Quran. People of the 21st century may have some difficulty with some of the values of the 7th century too. This means that we living in the 21st century need to identify with the people inspired by the Quran. Understanding their context will help us do this. Of course, for some Muslims, any discussion of the socio-historical context is seen as a threat to Islam. This is because for these Muslims, discussion of socio-historical context suggests doubts about the divine origins of the Quran. Personally, I don't think that this is the case. Understanding the context of the Quran is in no way undermines the divine origins of the Quran. Indeed, many Quranic verses cannot really be understood properly without knowing the context in which they were revealed. My own view is that the more we know about the pre-Islamic world of Hejaz, that is the western part of Arabia, and Arabia in general, in a cultural and historical sense, the clearer our understanding of the message of the Quran will be. And however beneficial contextualization is, it does require effort and patience. It also involves intellectual integrity. It means interpreting norms, customs and values in a way that is consistent with the period, rather than pushing our own agenda. So what values are we talking about? The norms and values 
of desert life at the time covered family structure, social hierarchy, taboos and rites of passage. They included firm views on gender relations, diet, housing and distribution of wealth. In what follows, we will see how the Quran generally offered a more progressive model of social relations than that practiced at the time of the early 7th century. In fact, the ethics inherent in the Quran can be read as an entire system of thought. Its vision of the good life emerged over two decades of revelations from 610 to 632 of the Common Era. Together, they constitute the ethical and legal basis of Muslim thought and practice. Very early on in Islam, even during the Prophet's lifetime, because of the success the Prophet achieved in bringing large numbers of Arabs to his religion, the notion of religious authority was transformed into a religious and political authority. This in turn facilitated the emergence of what we may call a state based in Medina from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of the Prophet's life. This means the notions of power and the rights of minorities, including perceptions of women and enemies, were reconfigured. Did the Prophet come to eradicate all cultural elements of life in Arabia? Significantly, the Prophet never claimed that he came to eradicate all cultural elements of life in Arabia at the time. His essential task was to teach new ideas that related primarily to God, God's relationship to people, and his creation, as well as a range of ethical and moral values. In fact, the way of life of the people of Arabia were, uh, was largely retained. The innovations introduced by the Prophet were primarily in theological, spiritual and ethical moral areas. We will now look at some salient contextual features to help us better understand the text that is the text of the Quran. Let us look at life in Mecca and Medina at the time of the Prophet. This map shows Arabia. Have a look at Mecca and Medina on the map. And we are also showing some images of Mecca including Kaaba which is the most important and sacred building in Mecca at the time. Mecca at the time of the Prophet was a relatively small town. It was situated on rocky land and was almost entirely dependent for its food supply on the nearby oasis of Taif. However, it had a seemingly miraculous source of water, the famous well of Zamzam. And this water source made settlement there possible. Most Meccan townsfolk belonged to the dominant tribe of Quraysh. The local shrine of Mecca was said to have magical powers. It was known as the Kaaba and contained a black stone. Here the image shows the black stone as it exists now. This black stone was believed to have been placed there by Prophet Abraham and his son Ishmael. In fact, the Kaaba itself was believed to have been built by Abraham and Ishmael. This itself links Arabs of the region, that is Hijaz, 
the western part of Arabia, to Abrahamic traditions of the Jews and Christians. The shrine, that is the Kaaba, attracted pilgrims from around Arabia, who worshipped a range of deities. Hundreds of such deities belonging to different tribes were reportedly placed in Kaaba. These people visited Mecca to perform a range of rituals. Being strategically situated on a major caravan trade route, Mecca benefited from the flow of these visitors, facilitating not only religious practice but also trade. Commercial affairs in the town were managed by influential elders and leaders of the richer clans. Although an informal consultative process existed, there was no ruler or formal state as such. Desert custom dictated social relations, including social order. Thus, if a member of a recognized tribe or clan was threatened, defense was guaranteed, if necessary by force. Like the Bedouin nomads, the Meccan clans provided safety and security for residents of Mecca. One must belong to a clan or a tribe to get this protection, something that is very similar to our notion of citizenship today. Here you are looking at some of the images from Medina. Medina or Yathrib, as it was known then, was a smaller settlement. It was different to Mecca in the sense there was some agriculture there. It was an oasis. After Muhammad left Mecca because of persecution to take up residency in Yathrib, it came to be known as Madinatun Nabi in Arabic or the city of the Prophet or in short Medina. Medina was quite different to Mecca. Medina was populated by several tribes. Most of these were in transition from nomadic life to agricultural settlement. Although the oasis was fertile, land for crop yielding areas was scarce. Each tribe jealously guarded its areas which were heavily fortified to exclude intrusion. Like Mecca, Medina was socially fragmented. Consequently, tribal hostility was a feature of life. At the time of the Prophet's arrival in Medina, the more populous tribes, uh, the Aus and Khazraj, were competing fiercely for resources. This situation regularly degenerated into open warfare. The presence of three Arabic-speaking Jewish tribes complicated the picture, as the interaction was made more fraught by religio-cultural differences. The Jewish tribes themselves were often divided or in conflict, although they shared a common religious identity with uh, other desert Jews, alliances occasionally took place across religious lines with the Aus and Khazraj. Thus, ethno-cultural diversity, fluctuating loyalty, not to mention political pragmatism, exacerbated relations and led to general social instability in Medina. Mm -hmm.